Pop culture depicting the mid to late 1800s in North America is defined by the movement West. Stories of gold, gunslingers, and an unjustified belief in manifest destiny. In the retelling of this history, the line between legend and reality is often blurred, with larger-than-life figures emerging as representations of good and bad, the white hat and the black hat. In truth, there were a lot more gray hats than we'd like to believe. In fact, probably most people fell into that category. But with all these shades of gray, one person, even though still lined with folklore and hyperbole, comes pretty darn close to donning the white hat. An Irish immigrant that was a prospector, a philanthropist, and credited with saving the lives of over 70 men. This is the story of Nellie Cashman, the angel of the Cassiar. Hi there, I'm Alec Belmore, and you're watching History and Intrigue. Ellen Nellie Cashman was born in Cove, County Cork, Ireland at the beginning of the Great Famine in 1845. Being Irish and an Irish Catholic during this time period was indescribably difficult, and by the time she was five she had lost her father and immigrated to the United States with her widowed mother and sister. They settled in Boston where by the 1860s Nellie was working as a bellhop in a hotel. Normally, this would be a job reserved for men, but during the Civil War, traditional gender roles were cast aside to fill the void left by soldiers going off to fight against one another. Legend suggests that during her tenure at the hotel, she met General Ulysses S. Grant, who told her, quote, The West needs people like you. And going West was an alluring prospect for a lot of people, even though, again, there were already rightful owners of the land. Between the Homestead Act of 1862, which encouraged westward migration by offering up to 160 acres of public land to settlers, and the xenophobia that an Irish immigrant would have faced in America at the time, or really any immigrant at any time in America, setting the sights westward seemed like a bang-up idea. So that's what Nellie did in the late 1860s, traveling across the country to San Francisco. Nellie would be described as, quote, prettier than a Victorian cameo and, when necessary, tougher than two penny nails. But above all, she had the adventure bug and she epitomized the rise and grind mentality. She'd always loved the thrill of gold rush stories, so she took a job as a cook in a mining camp in Nevada. By 1872, she and her mother were operating a boarding house in Peoch, Nevada at the height of the silver boom. For what would essentially be the next 50 years, Nellie would move from mining camp to mining camp, setting up businesses while pursuing her own mining ventures, and always moving on to the next town before the mine dried up. Shaped by the Great Famine in Ireland, Nellie is credited with having said, work as hard as you can, make as much money as you can, share what you have with the desperate, and get the hell out of Dodge when the money dries up. She was an extremely savvy business person, but the longest lasting historical records of her suggest she was also uncommonly kind, taking care of miners when they were sick or in need. Along her many travels, she would almost always donate her money to charitable organizations, hospitals, and Catholic churches, and would attempt to galvanize others to do the same. It's no surprise that in almost every place she went, she's referred to as the angel of insert town name here, or simply the Miner's Angel. Even her gravestone in Victoria, British Columbia, Canada, expresses the same sentiments, but we're not quite there yet. In 1874, Nellie and a group of miners allegedly flipped a coin over whether to go to Canada or to South Africa, and Canada won. So they headed northwards towards the Cassiar region, British Columbia, Canada. This area was experiencing its second gold rush after discoveries of gold were made in a place called Dees Lake, just north of Telegraph Creek. At Dees Lake, Nellie followed her similar pattern of establishing a boarding house, purchasing mining claims, and always taking care of the other miners. Which is why when she heard that 26 miners, struck with scurvy, were trapped in a snowstorm in the Cassiar Mountains, she couldn't just sit idly by and do nothing. She took a six-man party and pack animals carrying over 1,500 pounds of food and medical supplies and set out on snowshoes to aid the stranded miners. The journey was so perilous that the Canadian Army vehemently opposed the rescue. 
When they heard that she had gone through with it anyway, they sent a trooper out to stop her. He allegedly found her camped out by the Stikine River, where over a cup of tea, she convinced him that she and her party would continue the rescue mission as planned. And they were successful. Over 70 days later when they found the miners, there weren't only 26 of them, the number was closer to 75. And they were understandably grateful. So grateful in fact that when she asked them to donate money so the Sisters of St. Joseph could establish a hospital in Victoria, they happily obliged raising enough money to make it happen. In the 1880s, she moved back to the States, first to Tucson, Arizona, where she opened a restaurant called the Delmonico. But when she heard of a boom in Tombstone, she headed there just after the famous Earp Brothers arrived, first operating a general slash boot and shoe store, and later taking over a restaurant called the Russ House. According to one legend, when one patron complained of Nellie's cooking, Doc Holliday, known as the Deadly Doctor of the American West, drew his gun and asked the man to repeat his accusation. The man said it was the best food he'd ever had. And this is to illustrate how much she was universally loved, not only for the very real things she did, like building the Sacred Heart Catholic Church in Tombstone, but also for the stuff that makes us go, yeah, okay. Her time in Tombstone is defined by two such stories. In one, 16 hours into a 100-mile journey to Baja, California, her and her ragtag team of miners had already depleted their water rations and were suffering from dehydration. She allegedly forged ahead and returned with enough water to save the team, when in reality it's much more likely the whole gang simply turned around and went back the way they came from. In another story, following the Bisbee Massacre, an event where five outlaws robbed a general store, killing four people, the criminals were moved to Tombstone for a trial and execution. The excitement and eventizing of a public hanging infuriated Nelly, who actively protested against the people who were taking pleasure in someone else's death, including one ambitious grifter who built bleachers for the event. She befriended the outlaws in jail and, being a devout Catholic, offered them spiritual advice. The night before the execution, she led a group to destroy the bleachers and tear down the grandstand. Thanks to her rabble-rousing, the hangings did happen as planned, but out of view of the public. When she heard that the bodies were later to be exhumed for medical study, she hired some friends to guard the graves for over 10 days. Nellie Cashman was a wandering soul, and she didn't stay in one place for very long. She eventually went back up north to the Yukon to try her hand at tackling the Klondike Gold Rush. She finally settled down in 1923 in Victoria, British Columbia, Canada. Two years later, she died of pneumonia while being cared for by the sisters at St. Joseph's Hospital, the very hospital she helped build with the money raised from saving the stranded miners years before. If that ain't good karma, I don't know what is. Her death was heard across North America, her obituary remembering her philanthropy, her tenacity, and her kind soul in newspapers as far away as New York City. So about the white hat. Time has a tendency to change the way we remember people, to soften or to harden our perceptions of them, rightfully or wrongfully. If you dissect any person's history, you're going to find some things you don't like, even with someone like Nellie Cashman, who despite her apparent goodness, was still a citizen of a country that endorsed the taking of land that wasn't theirs to take. But what sets Nellie Cashman aside from her contemporaries was her understanding that to whom much is given, much is required. Or to put it in other words, with great power there must also come great responsibility. She knew that because she had the ability to help others, she had a moral obligation to do so. And I think we could all use a little bit more of saving the world in us. There's a lot of work to be done, so let's get to it. And I do mean you, specifically, the person watching this video. Thanks for watching.